Fantastic. So um, I did prepare this with graduate, beginning graduate students in mind. So um, that's the audience. And I wanted to give a, so I, I was writing this and I tweaked my title and changed it to a skeptic's guide to jets. And so what I'm going to start with is talking about reconstructed jets, but um, with a focus on what I think um, what I think that you should n know and be aware of. And this is a standard. These are all the people I got stuff from, except that in a, I really mean that I should take full responsibility for the things that you like, that you do not like, because um, I am not sure that the people here agree with me on a lot of these things. Um, and I'm being a little bit deliberately provocative. Um, okay. so. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here are some questions that I think in general experimentalists should ask when, when you're going to do a measurement. What do I want to learn? What am I measuring? What assumptions am I making? What are the dominant uncertainties? And how do I compare it to models? And the answers, I think, for jet measurements are highly non-trivial for pretty much all of these. And so I'm going to start with a, the, what I consider the cartoon picture of what I want to learn, which is sort of what I learned in graduate school and, you know, when you're giving a 10 minute APS talk, what you say in the introduction, because of course you don't have time to get into subtleties. And, and the brief idea is that you, you want a med you want a probe that you can shine through your medium. You look at how it interacts with the medium. You see how it is modified and you, by measuring it in a detector on the other side. And this is, analogous somewhat to spectroscopy, vis visible light spectroscopy, where you can in principle determine the properties of whatever it is in your sample by looking at how the probe is modified. And the problem is that the probes in this, these collisions are very short lived, one to 10 Fermi over C, so you can't use an external probe. So what you use instead is a, is a probe that is created in the collision. Um, and we expect the medium to be dense and therefore to absorb and modify or modify the probe. And we kind of see this. This is the good news. So here you can see an event display sort of from Atlas. This is from one event and on the um, and the phi axis, this is the angle around the detector. On the eta axis, it is the direction along the beam pipe. And when you have peripheral collisions, you see that when you have some type of hard parton scattering, you in fact see two back-to-back -back, um, peaks and pe two correlated peaks in energy that are roughly back-to-back -back that correspond more or less to the, the scattered partons. And when you look in central lead lead collisions, you see one um, peak that corresponds to one of the partons, but then on the other side, you see maybe a warm spot, but you don't see that back to back peak that you were expecting. So it kind of works. Um, and but that's that's not good enough. We want to actually get something quantitative. Um, so as an example, because I'm going to be talking about spectra, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, what we do with single, and because the audience is a little more senior, I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, single hadrons. It, in principle, we'd want to do something similar with jets. So we have the nuclear modification factor. Um, given the audience, I'm going to assume you've seen this, and I'm going to move on to the base. Yep. Is there a question? Okay. Okay, so I will go through I will go through the intro. Sorry?
Okay, so I'm going to use what Soren likes to say, and he stole from someone, but I forget whom, which is that RAA is what you get out divided by what you expect. So you take the proton-proton spectrum, usually as a function of momentum, and you divide it by, or sorry, you take the gold-gold spectrum, usually divided by um, divided by the proton-proton spectrum, multiplied it by the number of nucleon-nucleon collisions that you expect to see in your um, in your collision. So if RAA is greater than one, this is enhancement. If it is less than one, you see suppression. Well, you call that suppression. And then we ignore the low PT part. Sometimes when I'm giving a talk, I will put a dragon here and say, here be dragons, because when you are talking about uh, hard probes you usually try to work in the region where you where, where it's high momentum and in principle the idea is that you could calculate things perturbatively and then what you see um, is so here you have two controls. So this is proton lead collisions in blue. This is just charged hadrons and proton lead collisions in blue. This is um, photons in direct photons in green so direct photons at high momentum in green but in a uh, um, lead lead collision and what you see if you ignore the stuff going on at low momentum is that the two probes you expect to be a control are in fact consistent with one so you see no modification um, and then when you look at charged hadrons in uh, in a central nucleus nucleus collision you see quite substantial suppression um, and this suppression is colloquially called jet quenching we expect that the photons are not suppressed because we think of the we think the medium should be transparent to electromagnetic probes and you can do this with a lot of other particles, not just unidentified charged hadrons. So on the left is the Phoenix t-shirt plot um, with everything that has been measured. Um, well, a large swath of what's been measured, um, just showing in one um, figure, the electromagnetic probes in orange consistent with one and the colored probes, which are all of the other colors, um, show significant suppression. Um, and then the plot on the right is, the sim is a similar plot, but for the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so this roughly fits with our idea, um, but this is for single hadrons. And what we want to do, the idea behind jet measurements is that you actually, the cartoon idea is that you're trying to measure the parton's energy itself and that this should give you a better constraint on partonic energy loss. So I'm going to talk about just today, I'm just going to talk about jet spectra um, when you try to reconstruct the entire jet. So I'm going to start with what am I measuring? What is the definition of a jet? And I'm going to start with a little bit of a baseline for theoretical calculations. So any, pretty much any calculation of a hard process involves starting with something called the factorization theorem. And you can see the equation here where you're, you look in the parton distribution functions, you're um, calculating the probability of pulling a parton with a momentum fraction x sub a out of, um, out of nucleus a and then there's a probability for f pulling a parton B out of nucleus B. Um, and then you multiply by the perturbative cross section. And um, then you, once this, at that point, you have the, you have an estimate of the cross section for producing your final state parton C. And then you calculate the probability, you use a the fragmentation function to, to get the probability for that parton C producing a hadron H. Um, so the factorization theorem assumes that you can factorize these three, to three components so that you can treat them separately. Um, and what people really mean when they say that something is perturbatively calculable when you're talking about 
proton-proton collisions or heavy ion collisions, anything um, where you're, because you really can't collide a parton with another parton cleanly, um, and you cannot ever get out of the um, fragmentation functions. So this is what they mean, but the parton distribution functions and the fragmentation functions are both explicitly non-perturbative. Only the green part is perturbative. Um, and another subtle point, when you hear people talking about fragmentation functions, theorists and experimentalists mean different things. What comes in this equation is the probability when you have a parton C for it to lead into a hadron with a given momentum, carrying a given momentum fraction of the parton. Um, and theorists usually use these fragmentation functions starting with partons that are uh, somewhere here. They're at the beginning of the shower. They might be next to leading, not leading order. But um, what experimentalists measure, you, you experimentally you don't, and I'm going to talk about why, you don't really measure the energy of the parton. So what you measure is a jet and you end up not measuring the full energy of the parton that way. And you can try to make corrections for the up to the total energy of the parton, but that's a model dependent correction. What's direct, when, when you go to quark matter and you see people measuring fragmentation functions, that, that Z is the fraction of the, the fraction of a hadron's momentum, the, the fraction of momentum that a hadron carries of the jet's momentum or energy. It is not of the parton. Um, so if you want, if you want to actually do these calculations, that fragmentation function is a little bit dependent on corrections to, to data for measuring fragmentation functions because we don't have measurements of fragmentation functions, not what theorists use. I would also make a couple subtle points. So there is a process, there's two processes that often get um, confused when people are talking about these things, fragmentation and hadronization, um, probably because the terminology is just confusing. So fragmentation happens in QCD and it is in principle at least partially calculable perturbatively. This is where if you have a parton, it splits up into multiple other partons. Um, and hadronization is when those partons then form final state hadrons. Um, there, the fragmentation function, whether you're talking about what theorists mean or what experimentalists mean, that fragmentation function often um, fudges the two, blends those two effects together. And then most theories for heavy ion physics, for jet quenching, somehow involve more or less modifying the fragmentation function. There can be slightly different approaches to how it's done, but they mostly change that and not the, they're not actually changing QC, the QCD part, the perturbative part. You're assuming that you can actually use both the parton distribution functions and the perturbative cross sections to estimate what you have before you get any medium interactions at all. Yeah. Ooh, that's a that's a good question, and I don't think I can give an answer off the top of my head. Um, also, the theories don't necessarily always entirely distinguish, um, and 
I, I mean, the, the fragmentation happened in the part, which is also sometimes called the parton shower. This happens first. Um, and it's a little faster, but I, I don't know. I don't know a proper answer with units on for you on that. All right. So now, jet finders, and this really gets at the heart at what it means to measure a jet. So, what is a jet? Um, if you ask my close colleague Soren, although I think we're working on him on this he would tell you that a measurement of a jet is a measurement of a parton. And this is certainly what I heard a lot in the field 10 years ago, even though we knew it was not true then. Um, so if you look at a, an event display, and here I've got on the left one from STAR, and on the right there's one from CMS, these are two events so showing die jets, so you have partons which scattered in off of each other um, in these are both proton proton collisions and um, then because you have two back-to-back -back partons you t see two back-to-back -back collimated sprays of particles um, and you can kind of tell what you want the where you think a jet should be so if I tell you there's a jet going somewhere here you go yeah yeah there is there's one jet here there's one jet there there's one jet here there's one jet there um, most people would agree so uh, you might sort of end up with a definition of a jet that well uh, I know it when I see it um, and that is to some extent when you talk about the jet finders that were in use um, at Fermilab in the 1990s they kind of tweaked the algorithms for finding jets until they got what they expected to see. And they also sort of went into generators and went, well, I'm trying to get the parton energy. Do I actually capture, capture the entire parton energy? Let me tweak my algorithm until I get what I think I should see. Now, if you guys know what Supreme Court case this is that I'm referring to, you'll, you'll know that that course case was not um, held up. It's not good enough for the law. It's not good enough for science. So what we have are jet finding algorithms. Jet finding algorithms take input. If you're talking experimentally, you're gonna put in reconstructed tracks or clusters from a calorimeter. If you're running them on a theory, you're gonna, on a model, you're gonna put particles in and depending on what calcula calculation you're doing, that either could be, um, that could either be partons or it could be final state hadrons. You put them into a jet finding algorithm, out you get jet finding candidates. Um, so the algorithms kind of treat any object as input. The a caveat is that, this, that um, the output is only as good as the input. So if you give them garbage, you get garbage. Um, and I, I will talk about this. We want to use the same algorithm on theory and experiment. So. Um, I think it was in the 90s that they had the snow mass accord. So you had this mess where people were doing jet finding algorithms and they'd start doing something where they'd look at all particles above 2 GV and try to form a jet around that. Well, now you have this problem that you have jets that overlap. Should you split them? Should you merge them? What should you do? Um, and Theorists were then looking at these calculations and theorists were comparing calculations done on the parton level or NLO calculations to experimental measurements and uh, the theorists were going, but wait, we can't really do exactly what you measured and how do we know that our calculation is comparable to your measurement? Um, and so they had this agreement that looked at how you can actually make a measurement that is comparable between data and models. Um, and they came up with some, not with what jet finder you should use, but what are the properties of a jet finder that we can actually apply to both theory and models. Um, yeah? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I I have a slightly different way of wording it, which I'll get to, which is a jet is what a jet finder finds. So what you want is that you want it to be ideally infrared safe and collinear safe. Um, and I'll define this in a bit. And in principle, the idea was that you wanted it to be insensitive to hadronization. It doesn't really work that way. They are somewhat sensitive to hadronization. But the agreement was, OK, we come up with a jet finder. You run the jet finder on, cal on theoretical calculations and on experimental measurements. And you use the same algorithm and both. And then they should be comparable. But you will notice that this definition does not include anything about a parton. There is no parton in this slide. So um, in principle, though, now you want to measure partons. You are somewhat more sensitive to partons by doing a jet finder than by looking at final state hadrons. The idea in principle was that you would integrate out over hadronic degrees of freedom, which I would sort of say, if you look at a large enough jet cone, you're not too sensitive to how that parton breaks up into multiple hadrons. So you kind of, the particle physicists often use very wide jet cones so that they are much less sensitive to, um, well, they used to, um, they're now doing crazier things, but so that then you're less sensitive to exactly how that fragmentation and hadronization happens. OK, and you want infrared and collinear safe. What does this mean? Um, it is very, very hard theoretically to calculate um, the probability for, you can have a gluon moving along, and that gluon can split into two gluons that are very close in angle. And that is basically always allowed, but the probability is very hard to calculate in a theory. So you don't want to be sensitive to that because the corrections to your theory will be large. So you don't want, um, you want something which is collinear safe, that it doesn't matter if you split one particle into two particles going in the same direction, you should get the same jet. This is in contrast to, for instance, some of the early jet finders would, if you require that you have at least one 2 GeV hadron, then you have um, an explicit sensitivity to whether or not your, um, to how your um, parton hadroniz hadronizes or even fragments. And then infrared safety, basically you don't want to get, get an infinite cross section as you go to low energies. So some jet finders would just allow you, rather than dealing with splitting and merging, they'd allow you to have particles in multiple jets. And um, then you get, it, theoretically, because you can always have very soft gluon emission off of a parton, and if it's a little amount of energy, you can make a lot of these particles. So if you allow particles to be in multiple jets, for instance, you'll get um, an infinite cross section as you go to a very low energy. So you don't want that because your theory can't handle it. So we come up with these algorithms. So there's basically a list of four algorithms which meet these conditions. Um, and I'm going to go through three of them and skip the fourth. So the KT fi jet finding algorithm, for this what you do is that you take all pairs of particles or so plus, I'm going to call them particles, but it doesn't matter from the jet finders perspective, whether they are tracks or clusters or theoretical particles. And you calculate this quantity, which is um, the dij, so a measure of the separation. So it is in the KT algorithm, it's the lowest PT of the pair um, squared times the distance between the two particles. And you find the, and then you look at the PT of the particle as another d. Um, I, J, you combine the lowest, um, whatever the lowest one is, you combine it and call it a 
you combine it into one and call it a jet. And um, if the lowest one is a DIB, you call it a jet. And you repeat this until there's no particles left. Um, and what will happen here is that by construction, all of your particles will be put into jets. Um, so I call them jet candidates. And I'm sorry, I could not understand the question. I think you are right, correct. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will try to fix the slides. At, um, but I have that mistake a couple other times through here, so please just ignore it. Um, okay, so the difference with, so let me say this algorithm, the KT jet finding algorithm, then starts because you're looking for the minimum, you start at the lowest momentum particles and you start forming clusters around those. Um, and it leads to these sort of funky shaped jets. Um, and you have, ah, and I, I should have a R for the jet finding algorithm, which is called the, the resolution. So you divide this delta R by the resolution parameter squared. So the resolution parameter is another, it's just an input for the model. So it's a, you choose it, but, and it's more or less kind of a measure of how big the jet is. Um, although it doesn't have to fit in a cone of radius R. Anti-KT just has PT to the negative two. So the anti-KT jet finding algorithm starts around the hardest particles. And what you'll see, so this algorithm is used most in heavy ion collisions because it's somewhat less sensitive to the background because it starts at high PT particle, with high PT particles. Whereas the KT jet finding algorithm explicitly starts at soft particles. So we'd expect it to be more sensitive to the, um, to the to the background. And then Cambridge Aachen just looks at the separation between two particles with no momentum weighting. This can be useful if you want to look at the way that uh, that something that a particle that say a parton is breaking up. There's a couple uses uses for the Cambridge Aachen jet finding algorithm that where you're, you're trying to be less sensitive to how much momentum is being carried. What I think you should remember about this other, so I'd, I'd like you to remember that there's nothing having to do with a parton here. It's just an algorithm for how you group stuff together into clusters of particles. Um, and then, you know, it's a, uh, you could look up the steps um, there. These are already implemented really well in a library called FastJet, which is the standard code used. Um, and in my opinion, there's no reason to fiddle with these jet finding algorithms. I think they serve all of our purposes. So mostly what we should be doing is not tweaking how you recombine combine particles to form clusters, but how we think about, you know, how we actually do the measurement. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think this is very basic, but I'm aware. So the PIT, uh, I think the PT is the uh, PT squared, and after yeah. PT is the PT minus two, and uh, so this uh, this uh, no PT is the PT squared. Uh, uh, let me double check and correct the slides, unless um, I I admit that I looked up the. Cambridge Aachen algorithm quickly. Um, I it, it's I started with my anti KT slide and then tweaked it from there. Um, so it's just a set of I think that it'd be if you don't have anything that if if it I think you might call it one. Let me let me look it up and. I'll get back to you. Okay, so this ends up with the definition that a jet is what a jet finder finds.
So not really related to partons, and it's not the picture that I learned in graduate school. Okay, so I've told you all this and, you know, warned you that we're making assumptions that all of these theoretical calculate, when people say that it's perturbative, they're still um, somewhat sensitive to non-perturbative effects. Nevertheless, here you can see a jet cross section um, in proton-proton collisions um, and compared to a bunch of theories on it, on the bottom, you've got ratios to those theories um, and you see the pink line does not have um, hadronization included. The, the green one does, but it's got humongous error, or does not, but it has humongous error bars, so it's not that precise. Um, and you see between the pink and the green, or sorry, the pink and the blue, you'd, the blue agrees better. This one, this is when it actually takes hadronization into account properly. So all of this said that, you know, you do have these non-perturbative effects, but you still can calculate something like this. You can still calculate a cross-section really well. And here you have the ratio of cross-sections at two different jet radii, um, again, compared to different theoretical models. Here, some of the uncertainties cancel out in the measurement, so, and I believe also in the theory. Um, so you see that the one that to really describe this, sorry, to really describe this ratio best, what you need is you need a model with hadronization, um, and yet you know it works when you do that. So um, for something simple like jet spectra in proton-proton collisions, we actually, when we say that we have a calibrated probe, that's not too far from the truth. So this is my mini summary. Um, jets are not partons. Good jet finders are, need to be infrared and collinear safe. If you go on and do anything with reconstructed jets, you're going to hear those terms again. And there's the list of the four jet finding algorithms that are infrared and collinear safe. Um, that are in wide use. I know there's been a few attempts at something different. I don't know that we need anything. <laughs> Um, jets are defined, the jets are defined by both the jet finder and its resolution parameter. Um, so uh, often people um, fudge the difference between a resolution parameter and a radius. Um, its resolution parameter is the more correct term, although for something like the anti-KT jet finding algorithm, it roughly corresponds to the radius of jets that you will get. Um, all jet measurements are somewhat sensitive to non-perturbative effects. And what the difference is, and I would say this is also true of anything you're talking about measuring, um, where people say it's a hard process, also heavy flavor. Um, but you know, they do have differing sensitivities to these non-perturbative effects. So you can try to come up with observables that are more sensi less sensitive or more sensitive to hadronization. L less sensitive is not necessarily better because sometimes they're also less sensitive to the physics that we want to measure. Um, but overall, in this nice, neat little environment, you see that you get pretty good agreement between theory and experiment. Okay, and here is where I get on my soapbox. What assumptions am I making in doing a jet measurement? Um, so again, on the left, a, a star event display for proton-proton collisions, on the right for gold-gold, and we want to try to find a jet in the mess on the right. That is hard. So, there is a standard paradigm, and I, I think, so this is the assumption every measurement makes, but I'm not sure that they always elucidate what they're making, what the assumption they're making. So you would break the event into what you call background and what you call signal. Um, and you can, your, your jet finder 
is just a dumb algorithm. You can write this in a for loop. It wouldn't be the most efficient implementation, but you could sit down and write any of those jet finding algorithms in 20 minutes. Um, it, but the, what they will do is they will put every particle into a jet. Um, so then you end up with combinatorial jets, which are those jets that are made out of particles that you that are just combinations of particles where the idea is that they are not created by a hard process. There's no correlation. There's no process which leads them both to be produced. Um, so I actually will talk about a model study we did where you show you really just throw random numbers. Um, and then you have jets that are your signal. Um, ah, I wanted to also introduce the other term. I prefer the term combinatorial jets um, because I, I feel like I am not making a um, value judgment on, about those jets. You will also hear these called fake jets. Um, so these two terms are sort of interchangeably used. Um, yes. <laughs> right. Um, that's a good question. The in proton proton collisions. The, uh, the motivation behind jet finders was that um, basically you need some coherent way to group your particles into these clusters we call jets. And in principle, if you have a jet, if you run a jet finder on Pythia and it groups a bunch of particles that are 100, 200 MeV together, and it calls the, your jet finder, um, calls it a jet candidate. Um, it's a jet. There's, there's no real fundamental distinction between that jet and a 50 GeV jet, except that we trust our model at 50 GeV and we don't trust our model at 200 GeV. Um, in principle, you could do the same thing in heavy ion collisions and run your jet finder on all of the particles in the event and treat every single one of those as a real jet. That would be basically totally converting the approach in proton-proton collisions and particle physics to what we do in heavy ion collisions. Um, it, it isn't what we want to measure because we still, we've thrown out a strict idea of a parton, but we'd sort of kind of like to measure something which is hopefully kind of like a parton. Um, and so I'll, I don't know that I fully answered your question. I guess, I, I think that's not what the field does. Um, and let me describe what the field does. And then if you're not satisfied, ask another question. Okay, so when people, this is what people mean when they talk about combinatorial jets and fake jets, and they're assuming whether they say it or not that you can just split the event into these things. But of course there's gray areas because 
it, both theoretically and experimentally because if you have a hard parton come in and it scatters off a parton in the medium and gives that medium parton a, a little kick or makes an, a little hot spot in in the QGP so that you have more particles going in that direction are those signal are those jet particles or not that's not entirely clear um, so I think we're getting closer to gray areas and I have strong opinions about how we treat those gray areas um, but I you'll see them again Okay, so jet finding in AA collisions. Now we have these combinatorial jet candidates. We get energy smearing from this because, you know, really, if you're trying to measure one of these jets, the red particles are, are overlapping in space with the blue and the purple. So you have to, well, we'd correct for that. Um, and then we have these methods to try to suppress these combinatorial jets and focus their energy. Um, I do not think these are benign methods. I don't think they're necessarily wrong, but they are doing more than just poof, you get the right answer all the time. And then we tend to focus on narrow and high energy jets because they're easier, not because they're more interesting, but because we can measure them. Okay, so I'm going to show a couple of plots from simulations and here's a one page overview of our model. Um, basically, we just throw particles matching the momentum spectrum and then matching the VN that we observe in um, in the data. Um, so we actually tried to also get correlations between reaction planes, but this is really just a random number generator. Um, so by construction, it has no jets, no resonances, and we more or less get hydrodynamical correlations, but not um, no, nothing else. And that's one extreme. The other extreme is Pythia Angantir, um, which doesn't have any QGP. Um, it has lots of jets and resonances, but no hydrodynamics and no jet quenching. Um, so this is the extension of Pythia to a uh, nucleus-nucleus collision. All right. Now, sorry, what? Kind of. It, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that because they've tried to, they have a sort of implementation of, they have an implementation of an optical Glauber model um, for the initial state. And then um, there are, they also have multi-parton interactions and um, different interactions between strings. So, um, you can't, if you just took a bunch of proton-proton collisions, you'd get a slightly different answer. It's, an, it's a nice model, um, I, in my opinion, because it's very easy to use, and I already have code that ro runs Pythia, so switching to Angantir is easy. Um, it's aiming to be a model that has no QGP, but is, you know, sort of a baseline test. I think you can argue about whether or not it does that. But basically, we used it because it's easy. Okay, so um, here on the right, what you see is an example of what happens when you run the KT jet finder on a heavy ion collision. And what I want you to notice is that the entire area is covered by jet candidates. Everything's, everything's in a jet um, because there's particles everywhere and a jet finder will put all particles in a jet. Um, 
so what you do most commonly in, well, so there's, I'm going to talk about the area-based background subtraction, which is what um, Alice and Starr do. Um, and this was proposed by the FastJet authors, actually originally to handle pileup in proton-proton collisions. Um, and it's basically been adapted to heavy ion collisions. So because the KT jet finding algorithm starts with soft particles, um, you, you get a lot of, you get your jets clustered around soft particles. Um, and then you expect it to be more sensitive to the background. So you run your jet finding algorithm on, um, on your heavy ion collision, you want to throw out real jets. So you, you have a normalized measurement of the density, which is that you take the momentum, you could also take the energy. Um, you can either measure jets energy or jets momentum. Doesn't matter a ton which you choose as long as you're doing the same thing in theory and experiment. So you take the total momentum in all your jet candidates, you divide it by the jets area. Um, you can measure the, you can get the jet's area by throwing in these very soft particles into your jet finder. And then basically you're deciding which, which area, you know, if you have a very soft particle somewhere, which jet will it get grouped into? Was there a question? Okay. So you get the density row like that. And then in your, event, you you sometimes throw out the top one or two jets um, just to make sure you're not sensitive to the leading jets. And then you calculate the median row in your event and you use that to estimate your background. So then you would correct all of your jet energies by taking the raw reconstructed jet PT and subtracting off your estimate for the average background in that event. And you do this event by event. Okay, so here you can see on the left, you have um, the row um, plotted for different events versus the multiplicity of charged hadrons in the event. This is only for charged hadrons. Um, and then what you see on the right is the same thing as the plot. Um, the 2D plot is Pythia Angantir, and the points are what we call Tengen, our random number generator. If you look carefully at the fit parameters, you'll see that they pretty much give you the same slope. So you have a very strong dependence on just the number of particles. That pretty much sets your background density. Um, the slope is a little different, or sorry, the intercept's a little different, but there's a lot of details because the measurement doesn't go down to n charge equals zero. Um, and we're not too worried about the intercept, but they're still remarkably close. Was there a question in there? Okay. I'm gonna charge ahead unless I hear a question um, and sometimes there's audio glitches. So my apology, apologies if you're trying to ask a question, but just be louder. Okay, so then how can you test this? You can, you can do something, how can you try to understand what you um, have, you know, whether your background is, the behavior of your background better. So what you do, what was done in Elise, and we did some model studies on this, is random cones. So you're randomly drawing a cone in your event. You want to get some measure of what this background is doing. And you're gonna purposefully exclude the leading two jets because you don't want to, um, you don't want the real jets to bias this. And then you calculate the momentum of those random cones where they're your, your um, hold in for real jet candidates by taking the total momentum in the cone and subtracting off rho times the area. Um, and this is called delta PT and you'll get a distribution like this. And the data are um, without throwing out leading jets are in red, throwing out the leading jet is in blue. Um, and you see, so first of all, 
even though you're randomly drawing cones, you are getting some spread in the reconstructed energy because um, you're subtracting an average energy density and not the and not taking fluctuations into account. Yes. Okay, so then um, we want to understand this a little bit better. Um, I'm running. I'm running long, which is maybe not so surprising. Um, I had too much fun writing this talk, um, which is never a good sign. Yes. Not entirely, um, but partially. Mike Tannenbaum wrote a paper in around 2000 where he actually was trying to describe the, the ET distributions reported by NA49. And um, he basically said, well, if you have a single particle um, spectrum, which is a gamma distribution, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Actually, that's maybe even, I will say here, we did these same things in our models. So what, what Mike said is, let's assume you have a gamma distribution, which really just means that your spectrum is PT to some power times an exponential. And then you draw n particles from that distribution, then you will, that to get a so you're you're going to randomly draw 50 particles from that distribution and you're going to do it a bunch of times so if every event has a multiplicity of 50 and then you have a bunch of events then you can look at the distribution of energies that you have in that um, distribution or, sorry in that uh, in that sample and then you add a little bit of smearing for um, well, so the first thing is if you draw 50 random particles from a gamma distribution, you end up with another gamma distribution. And that gamma distribution, the gamma distribution has a tail. So at least part of it is because a gamma distribution is not symmetric. Um, now, what was done in the Alice paper is then they randomized the orientation of particles so that you'd break real jets and then that is compared to a fit of a gamma distribution and you see the black line is does not have significant deviate the data black points don't deviate significantly from the black line whereas the blue points appear to have a harder tail so you probably do have a little bit of a tail just the, i mean the tail is your real jets your real jets have to be in the tail but the asymmetry is partially not just because you're drawing from a random distribution so then you can look at that width um and uh you do so you ah that was so you get the width is then um, proportional to the square root of the number of particles you're drawing times the standard deviation of the momentum spectrum. And then um, you add in Poissonian fluctuations in the numbers and you assume that those Poissonian fluctuations are totally uncorrelated with the standard deviation of the momenta and you get this lovely formula here. Um, and then you, 
and that should work really well, except now we have flow. And then you assume Poissonian number fluctuations due to flow. And that gives you this lovely prediction for what the width of that distribution should look like. Um, and you can compare that to the Alice data, and that is the lines here. And you more or less see that it is a pretty good description of the width of those distributions. We did this in 10gen, which is our random number generator. Now you look at the Alice plot and you go, okay, it does pretty well. There's some deviations, but you know, we're talking about a real event. So maybe that's not so surprising. You have some correlations which are not um, flow or random. The beauty of 10gen is that everything in that event is random. Um, so when we compare, the, the labeling is poor, but uh, the circle, the circles are um, 10 gen without VN and then compared to the prediction for the width without VN, you see a few percent deviations. And we've tracked this down to basically the assumption that your incoming part, particle spectrum, single particle spectrum is a gamma distribution. That that's not a perfect assumption. So it leads to one to two percent deviations. Um, if you because in 10 gen we fit to the data, so to a blast wave. So we're closer to the real spectrum. And then if you include realistic um, correlations between the event planes, you get up to five or per, five or six percent deviations. So already with flow, you get some deviations. That appears to be kind of similar to what you see with the comparisons to the Alice data. Um, so what we conclude here is more or less, it pretty much looks like, you know, these random cones are consistent with, a ran with drawing a random background. Uh, the reason why we did not put 10 gen on the same plot as the Alice data is because the Alice data have fluctuations in multiplicity, which we do not have enough information to, re to recreate. Um, so there are actually some differences just because we don't have fluctuations in multiplicity. And the it's a little misleading because these points here are almost entirely the central bin. Um, so you can see the scale X scales are slightly different. Um, so then, you know, we also have some other evidence that, uh, that this background is pretty much random. So STAR did a measurement where they actually looked at hadron jet correlations and to look at their, to estimate their background, they constructed an entire event using mixed events. So if they have 300 particles, they take one particle from 300 events. Um, and if you can see the ratio on the, uh, of the, um, the data, so which they have called same event to the mixed events called, so same event is SE, mixed events is ME. And you see that the mixed events describe the data really, really well in the negative jet PT region where you would expect that they are all combinatorial because you physically cannot have a negative jet energy. Um, and they actually do reasonably well um, out to the lower PT. Now, the one thing I would say, so you can hide a lot on a log scale and they have chosen a log scale for that. Um, you will, if you read this, it looks like by the time you get to 20 G, sorry, to 10 GeV, the difference between same events and mixed events is a factor of two. Um, so Peter Jacobs will point at this plot and say mixed events describes the, um, the data over several orders of magnitude. Eh, eh, kind of. Um, 
And it also, if you listen to Peter Jacobs talk about this, he will also tell you that you need no parameters, but this is also not entirely true because at some point in any mixed event, event analysis, there is a normalization factor where you're making some assumption about which particles belong in the background and which do not. And that is also present in this analysis. And so, and this is also in a measurement where the background is suppressed because you're trying to describe jets where there is a high momentum hadron on the other side. So this is a, this is a gold gold collision at 200 GeV where you have a nine GeV hadron and then you're looking at jets 180 degrees away. So you quite frequently have a real jet there. It's not um, tested as much you know, it's a much harder problem to try to measure jet spectra because you're trying to describe, um, you're you're trying to describe more background. Here, you're enhancing your signal, um, so your signal to background is higher. We tried to implement mixed events for jet spectra at the LHC in Elise, and you'll notice that we did not end up publishing it because we had a very hard time reconstructing many features of the background and the mixed events did not compare to the data as well as they do here. Um, I think that that's because the multiplicities, you know, basically when you have jets in at Rick, they stand out above the background more. Um, also, I think the nature of the measurement that it is a jet hadron correlation, so your background is suppressed, that helps a lot. Nevertheless, this does pretty well. Um, and then here I have on the right hand side Pythia Angantir compared to that same random background generator. And what we've done in this plot, we actually had, if you want the details, read our paper, which there's a, the references a couple slides back. But um, the, the details get a little complicated. We've This particular plot, we've randomized the orientation of the tracks so that we have broken all physical jets. Um, and you see that this prediction no longer works, except now I know I have no correlations because we randomly reoriented them. So um, basically, I have maybe too many things highlighted on this slide, but We've, we've redone the derivations and unfortunately my grad student who was um, finalizing them to resubmit to the journal uh, got sick with the coronavirus. So uh, we have not resubmitted yet, but basically it's because of this assumption that your spectrum is a gamma distribution. And um, what I want you to take away from that is that when you're comparing to models, if you're, so a few things, first of all, a model that simulates the full event has background too. It's your, even though it's a model, you still have what we call background. And I think that this is actually getting somewhat related to the question earlier on um, about, you know, what sort of, sort of, if I try to paraphrase, why do you define the background that way? We don't have to. Um, it's not necessarily the right thing, but if you really are simulating all the particles in the event, they all get thrown into jet candidates. Um, then if you, but what you're doing when you're doing something like this, where you're ran, where you're trying to estimate the background and you're subtracting that off, you are sensitive, if you're trying to do this in a model, you're basically sensitive to the entire collision, all physics in the event. Because um, if your generator gets the shape of the spectrum incorrectly, then it get a different width than what we see in the data. Well, it's really generator to see the entire event correctly. That's just, I, I think that's not gonna happen can't wait to proceed until we have generators that do that. So my mini summary is that um, jet finders, if you remember nothing else, 
Pathfinder puts all input in uh, all input clusters or tracks, whatever you put into it, it puts it into a jet candidate. This is not related physically at all to what a parton is. We do see that what we call background is in fact dominated by these random combinations of particles. Um, it's so mostly you do have it's just as if you're drawing from a random distribution, but there are some effects at the 5% level which come from flow and which are really hard to take into account. Um, and then models have background too. It doesn't agree with the data and it's sensitive to both the multiplicity and the shape of the spectrum. Now, Gabor, I have written this with this talk with um, parts and many summaries because I'm doing it Tuesday again. Is there a, is there a place I would propose if people are still okay with it that I keep going six okay 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 oh okay then I will go and at six I have to go because yeah because you know I, I cannot give a talk with a five-year-old or a one and a half year old or it would be a very different talk Okay. So I think you're thinking on, so you're thinking of infrared safe, meaning that you can't get soft jets. You can get soft jets. So you can get a jet with, uh, it is it is allowed under the, the rules of the Snowmass Accord to have a jet that has 50 MeV or even five MeV. You're not allowed to have an infinite number of those jets. So if you have a very soft particle, um, it is likely to get grouped with other soft particles. Um, or sorry, sorry, it's likely a soft particle is likely to get picked up by another jet. If you can imagine a limit where your entire event is extremely soft particles, because the so if the if the whole event is covered with very soft particles, actually that's not too far from what we do in the heavy ion collision. Mm -hmm. And 
your entire event will be clustered into a bunch of jet candidates. But there's not an infinite number of them. So this, this resolution parameter that I actually somehow, I don't know how I managed to do this, I left it off of my slide, but it should be delta r squared divided by r. Um, this, this, Yeah, so your, your jets, more or less, while it's not really the radius of the jet, that resolution parameter gives you a size, it's, it gives you a scale of your jet. And so you mostly, if you cluster a bunch of soft particles over a given area, you're not going to get an infinite number of jets. Because each, each jet its natural size is this resolution parameter. Well, is the resolution pi times the resolution parameter sca sca squared. So you're. Yeah, you just can't go up to your cross section can't go to infinity. And that actually is why I wanted to go through all these details because if you listen to a uh, jet talk at a conference, they don't even tell you what the anti-KT algorithm is. Okay, so how do we deal with this background? Um, and I, I do think there is a value judgment in saying that this is background, but I think that it is the right judgment. Um, because you pretty much can describe a lot of this as random particles thrown together. Um, one thing that you do is that you focus on smaller angles. So um, your, if we go back to these equations that roughly describe the, the width of these fluctuations, they depend on the number of particles in the cone um, the square root of the number of particles in the cone. So if you have more particles in in your cone, on average, you are going to have larger fluctuations in your background. Um, and the background is not the problem when you're trying to make a measurement. It's the fluctuations in the background. Because if you always have, if you're always adding 50 GV to your jet, it's no problem. You can still measure that pretty well. So you want to minimize the fluctuations because that's what actually makes the measurement hard. Um, the, the downside is that most of our models for partonic energy loss actually predict that you have wider, that your modifications are further from the radius, from the center from the jet axis. So they're at larger angles. So if you only measure jets with a small resolution parameter, you're actually missing some of the important questions. Um, and I think my animation, that was an imperfect animation, but okay. The Another thing that we should be aware of is, at least if you're talking about leading order, um, if you're measuring narrow jets, you're explicitly biasing yourself towards quark jets rather than gluon jets because we've seen that gluon jets are broader and quark, quark jets are narrower. So the average distance of final state hadrons from the, um, from the jet axis is larger if those jets are gluon jets. So we've imposed a physics bias by doing that the very least we should be aware that we're doing that. And I wanted to highlight this, this aside, um, you hear a lot of talk about quark and gluon jets. Quark and gluon jets are only clearly defined terms at leading order. They are not clearly defined um, 
If you even have next to leading order, well, if you have a quark, it can spit off a gluon. And it's also possible that if a quark and a, if a quark split, splits off a gluon, it's not entirely clear which one takes the most momentum. So these pictures are um, imperfect and you should just be aware that's not entirely clear. Actually, my grad students, Charles and, um, and Pat were somewhat defying me, which I love. Um, and they were trying to figure out if something they were doing was selecting quark jets versus gluon jets. And they tried to figure out in Pythia how you even define the two. And it is not so trivial even in Pythia to figure out what a quark jet is and what a gluon jet is. When you in principle have, um, they were trying to look at the entire uh, event and you know, how do you, what do you call a quark jet or a gluon jet? That's not entirely unambiguous. Okay, so then, um, and actually I think I have this twice, um, this little aside. Um, the other approach is to focus at high momentum. So if you're at the LHC, if you're talking about a 200 GV jet, or if Rick, at Rick, if you're talking about a 100 GV jet, well, it doesn't really matter what you call the background because you're far above the background anyways. Um, so, you know, your signal to background is higher. That means it's easier to measure. The downside is that we expect modifications in the soft part of the spectrum. So if you don't measure the hard part of the spectrum, then, or sorry, if you don't measure the soft part, you're missing interesting physics. Um, there's also a selection bias. You may only be seeing the things that, um, that have not interacted with the medium. Um, and again, quark jets are, we know from some studies at, uh, at LEP that jets which are at leading order or a quark jet fragment on average into higher momentum particles um, than leading order gluon jets. So you're biasing your sample. Um, so here we're looking for the elephant. Well, if you only want to find the elephant, that's that's easy. Uh, if we have a whole bunch of mice, except that you uh, you maybe want to look at the mouseophants too. Fun fact, Google mouseophant and there actually is already a picture, so you don't have to make one yourself. Um, okay. Another approach is to explicitly apply a bias. So this is what was done in, actually, I'm not sure. I think Star did come out with a paper recently where they did not have a bias. But in the ALICE publication um, for both full and charged jets, uh, there is an explicit requirement that you have a 5GV hadron in your jet. Um, and this helps because it suppresses combinatorial jets. It also biases fragmentation. Um, and that, you know, so that's one way. Um, and you're still limited to small resolution parameters because these fluctuations blow up. They scale with the re resolution parameter squared. So it's a lot harder to measure large jets. Um, so I think I'll skip that. What we're looking for is this elephant and Eve, sorry. Okay, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I guess I'll, so in World War II, there was this uh, mathematician, the, the army was looking at where, um, when planes returned, um, they were looking at where the holes were in the planes and they wanted to, um, they were saying, well, here's where we, we, all, we always find holes in certain parts of the plane. This is where we need to add armor. And this mathematician, and I forget his name, but the link to the wiki is there and the slides are already posted. So he said, no, that's the opposite of what you want to do. You want to look for where, if you never find a plane that has a hole in a given spot, you need more armor there because planes which are shot there um, can't fly back. So, yeah. 
Yeah. So then if you apply that to jets, you want to always think about not just what you're seeing, but what you're not seeing. And even something which is large can be hidden in a large background. And, you know, here, so here I have some references to, uh, so, you know, to some of the, in, the LEP papers showing, you know, what we know about quark versus gluon jets. And, you know, we, so we have these complicated experimental methods and they make assumptions and apply biases. Um, and we may even, jets which have interacted heavily with the medium may actually look more like the medium. They may look more like our background than they look like a Pythia jet. Um, and here I have, I don't want to go through all of the um, steps in the ATLAS analysis, but this is the ATLAS procedure um, for doing background subtraction. ATLAS and CMS both use an iterative procedure where they cluster the event, they find jets, they try to, ex they exclude those jets, they redo the clustering without those jets, they estimate the um, V2, they interestingly do not estimate the V3 or the V1, even though these two terms are both comparable to V2 in a central collision. Um, and then they, Atlas requires, at, in one of the papers, which I have the reference somewhere here, requires at least 25, it requires a calorimeter jet to be matched with a track jet where there were, the track jet is comprised of tracks above 4 GeV and the track jet has to have at least 10 GeV. Um, this applies a bias, there's no way it doesn't. And at least in some of their early papers, they would say that they corrected for this uh, using a model. I, I don't know how. If you get people one-on-one, -on -one, they might admit that actually, yes, it applies a bias. Um, and that doesn't so much matter when you're talking about these very high momentum jets, but it does matter down here um, where you wanna compare. So this shows the Atlas and the Alice jet RAAs compared to CMS. CMS did, CMS has a somewhat less biased um, background subtraction algorithm. Um, the plot is very busy. Uh, this is somewhat complicated also by the different rapidity regions. Alice is of course much more mid rapidity and Atlas goes out to around two units in rapidity and CMS is closer to Atlas. Um, the uncertainties are huge, so you should not draw too many too strong of conclusions, but there, there is at least tension between um, Atlas and Alice and CMS, where the blue points should be comp blue CMS points should be comparable to the blue shaded Atlas bands, um, and then the red points, um, the red CMS points should be comparable to the red Alice data. Um, I worry about this. I think I, that's a little redundant. There are other instances where, so this is the ratio of the fragmentation function as a function of C, which is related to the fraction of momentum carried by the hadron. The um, red shows the preliminary data points shown at the quark matter in Onasi, and the conclusion was drawn that there is no modification of fragmentation um, the preliminary analysis, um, of course, on, did not go to extremely low PT because it's hard. And when they came out with the final analysis, you see the green and the yellow points. And that is, of course, where you start to see some of this modification. Um, so we have to be careful about what exactly, we, what, we, what we see and what we don't see. Um, so then I have my mini summary, which is that many studies in explicitly apply a non-perturbative bias or 
implicitly apply a non-perturbative bias, which is not always acknowledged in the papers and especially the talks. They focus on small r, they focus on high momentum. This is where everything is nice and easy. Um, and they may also have survivor bias. And in my opinion, the background subtraction algorithm should be part of the definition of the jet finding algorithm. And my only next, uh, yeah, I have two more parts, which I think that are already written, which I think it's good to then do on, um, on Tuesday next week instead of continuing. Yeah. Not yet. Uh, he, his dad is picking him and his brother up from, from daycare. But, um, so I have time for one or two more questions if people would like. Um, I am not hearing any. Let me, um, 